we shall be looking at something very, very important. And our topic for today is going to be the power of joyful living. The power of joyful living. Uh, we will take as much as we can because of our time. But I want us to pay attention. I don't want us to get distracted. Because there is a power and it's a weapon at the same time. You know, to be able to battle the kingdom of the enemy. And that is why we don't want us to be distracted. The power of joyful living. And the test, oh yeah, it's been projected, is from Psalm 89 verse 15. You know, I was asking my son, I said, what does it mean to be joyful? Joyful living. And the young boy looked at me and said, well, dad, that uh, somebody who is always happy. I'm happy that he didn't just say happiness. He said, somebody who is always happy. I said, well, yeah, 95, 96%, okay. Somebody who is, the fact that he said, always happy. So in other words, it means somebody who is always joyful. Joyful, regardless of the circumstance or situation. Somebody who is always joyful regardless of the situation or circumstance in which the person has found himself. A joyful person that is living a joyful life is free from sadness, trouble, and torment. Did I hear somebody say, huh, Brother Sunday, how is this possible in this wicked world? Yes, we live in a world where there is a lot of torment, a lot of trouble. But God is going to be showing us tonight some of the key practices we can put in place so that we can live a joyful life. Right from time in memorial, the devil has just one goal. And that goal is to ensure that we don't live a joyful life as Christians. The devil is interested in inflicting and afflicting pain, sadness, Putting people under pressure, ensuring that happiness and joy is far away from us. I discovered that when a man is joyful, he lives a longer life. A man that is joyful lives a longer life. Have you seen some people, please, no offense, but it's something that I have taken time to look around. Have you seen some people? When you look at their face, you kind of tell yourself that, oh, this, this person should be between 50 and 60 years old. But when they tell you their age, that they are 22, you are kind of, <laughs> really? No, have we come, come across such people? You kind of like 22, because you'll be expecting them to tell you they are 50 or 60. Why? The devil, that is what the devil does. The devil wants to battle us, afflict us with pressure. Do we realize that there are some people, like Pastor Polana, every time I see her, even when the message is going on, you see smile. Am I communicating? Yes. You, there are some people that naturally, you see them, they are filled with laughter, they are filled with smile. But the devil, all he wants to do is to ensure that he afflicts us with pressure. That is why a brother... That you will see and greet. Oh, brother Sunday, how are you doing today? Mm. This is a brother that when you greet him, he, oh, bless God. You know, he, you know why? Because the experiences of the pressure he's going through is forming a new character in him. And what do I want to encourage us today? When we see such brethren, what we are supposed to do is not to look at them and say they are possessed with demons. But rather, we should go to them and say, brother Sunday, you used to smile. What happened? Is everything okay? Oh, Brother Santos, you know what? Today has been very hectic. And they will be able to pray. Not to say, oh, that brother is like a demon has started possessing him. Because of the experiences in which he's passing through. And that is what the devil wants to do. I have come to understand that when you go to a home that is full of joy, they don't need to tell you. I know that there are some homes, like back home in Africa, they used to have all this war frame where they will show it and say, oh, our house is full of joy. 
The friend says so, our house is full of joy. But when you look at their face, you know that uh, there's sadness going on in this place. No, honestly, if you go to a home where joy is reigning, there is this, uh, there is this aura, there is this, you feel it, you know that something good is happening here. So the devil wants to ensure that even though they have the frame, it is not happening in their homes. And a home that is joyful, laughter is never far away from their such homes. Only God knows some people, the way I see some people's face, I ask myself, do they even smile at all? And that is what the devil is doing. The devil wants to make sure that laughter does not come near your dwelling place. Are we going to allow the devil? No. Because one thing the devil hates so much is laughter. Laughter angers the enemy. Because laughter means I am victorious. That is what laughter means. Oh, you know, there is a way you will laugh. Even your enemy will be angry at you. Very true. Do you know that if some people are quarreling and you start to laugh, the other party will be getting angry the more. Because he expects you to be angry, he expects you to be sad, but you are laughing. The thing will be annoying him the more. Just imagine. Uh, for those of us that came from Africa, where we have to go to the embassy to apply for visa and all the rest of it all. There was a time, my very first visit to U.S. Embassy. I was sitting down close to somebody, and honestly speaking, if you are looking for physical humility, you will find it in U.S. Embassy. People sit down so, people that can talk when they go to the embassy. Sir, man, they, they, because they are afraid, they don't know what will be the next line of action. So I was sitting close to this guy. Somehow we got talking. They were calling number. We were going. So the guy looked at me after a while and said, uh, is this my first time? I said, yes. Uh, he said, your first time. <laughs> he said, he's not sure if I will have this visa. Oh, I said, why? He said, because this is his fourth time and they keep refusing him. <laughs> that if they refuse him, that honestly speaking, nobody will get visa. That he will make sure that nobody gets visa here. So, in my heart, I wanted to tell him that, ah, back to sender, that if they, don't, if they refuse, you go back home, please. But when I looked at his face, the guy was like this. When I looked at his face, I swallowed what I wanted to say. I couldn't say it again. Because coming to America meant so much to him. He wanted the visa. So, anybody that is going to say anything contrary to what he wants is going to be in trouble. But as God will have it, they called me, I quickly left. And when I was coming back, it was like, did you get it? But thank God, you know, you have to, go, for those of us, you have to go to the other room to get your passport and everything. Because that guy can take it, he can take it from my hand. What are we getting at here? The devil lost a position that was very vital, that was very sensitive. The Bible says he was thrown out. Of, do you know what it means? It was the archangel. It was like, I do not know maybe to use the word PA. When God needs music, God says, see, I need the angels to organize. The devil was very close to God. He understood how sweet heaven was. He knows how beautiful. The, the devil, just in case we don't know, knows how heaven is. He knows how beautiful the place is. And he was thrown out. And you think the devil will be happy, be, I mean, will be happy with you and me that desires to go to heaven, he will make sure that he puts us under pressure. And when a man is under pressure, brethren, when a man is under pressure, he misbehaves. When a man is under pressure, he's easily angered. When a man is under pressure, he's frustrated. I remember those times when we just came to Canada newly. I didn't know anywhere. Till today, I still don't know places. I use GPS everywhere. The only place I don't use GPS is my house, the church, and my place of work. Any other place... I don't even like going to Southwest because there are some roundabouts that you keep turning, you keep, you go to the left. So I don't like going to such places. Rather, I take drop. Brother, what am I getting at? I used my GPS. We were going. We were going. All of a sudden, I got to this unusual roundabout somewhere in Southwest. The GPS just said, recalculate it. Oh! And he said, he said, exit that you, I will soon be exit, uh, exiting. And all of a sudden, the GPS started to say, recalculate it, recalculate it. And all of a sudden, the signal, everything went off. Jesus, I'm in the midst of, I do not know to I to exit here or exit there. And honestly, there is nothing as frustrating where you don't know where you are going to. My wife, 
was ready to say, honey, calm down. If you see my face, Jesus Christ. Because I was under, I was, I hate to be under pressure. The GPS, when the GPS came alive, we have already passed where we are supposed to exit. I said, God, I'm turning back. That is what the devil, the devil knows that when there is confusion, when there is frustration, you can no longer be yourself. That is why in most homes, laughter is not something. And that is what the devil desires to do. Because he does not want us to laugh. Because he knows that laughter is a sign of joyful living. Somebody who is laughing is always on the winning side. And laughter is very contagious. In a home where the father does not laugh or the mother does not laugh, what do you think will happen to the children? Some of the children will not even know how to smile. Because that is always... Or shouting. That is why laughter is a key sign in every joyful home. I saw a video clip. And when I, anytime I see this video clip, I'm always excited. I do not know if Ramarat or Brapita are ready. Their place will want the video clip to be projected. Okay, this is the video clip, please. It's contagious. It's contagious. Do you know one thing I've come to discover about laughter? It is medicinal. No wonder the scripture says in Proverbs chapter 17 verse 22, it says, a merry heart does good like medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bone. In other words, a heart that is not merry does evil. That is what he's simply saying. A research was carried out in the U.S. And in this um, home, they discovered that people were really, really sick. So they took out some of them. They started taking them out to the playground where they have children laughing, giggling, and playing, and all the rest of it all. So they now discovered that after three months of taking out these sick ones to the playground to watch children laughing and playing, they started getting healed faster than the other ones that don't go out. Because they discovered that laughter, a man that laughs, they said 78% of the hormone respons responsible for youth, I mean, it's increased 78%. I'm not sure, maybe 78 or 87% of that hormone, of the youthful hormone in our body, it increases by 87%. I said, no wonder I'm looking younger. <laughs> Praise the Lord. 87%, the more you laugh, that youth hormone is increased by 87%. I said, no wonder it is medicinal. Brethren, we don't have to be sick if we learn to laugh more. If we learn to be joyful. Somebody is saying, but ah, in this wicked world, with all the situations, the economy and everything, brethren, that is why we, I said, we'll be looking at some vital keys on the things that will keep us being joyful 
regardless of the situation or circumstance that we have found ourselves. The situation you are going through is for your promotion. It's just that it is in disguise. That is one thing we need to understand. We will be taking a case study here today. We'll be looking at the life of Paul. I'll be using Paul as our case study for some of those vital keys we need to look out for. And we'll be looking at Philippians chapter 1, verse 12 to 26. Philippians chapter 1, verse 12 to 26. You know, because most of the times, we tend to tell ourselves that, oh, I can be joyful if I can solve this problem, says who? Oh, I can be very joyful. It's just this problem. If I can get this problem solved, I will always be joyful. Brethren, there is nothing like that in this world. There is nothing as if I can solve this problem. You can never solve any problem. Because you, what happens is that when you get through one problem, another one is going to rise. So does that mean that you will never be joyful because problem keeps coming or what? We must learn to be joyful, even in that situation in which we have found ourselves. So, what are the keys? Somebody once asked me, he said, what is the difference between happiness and joy? And I told the person, I said, see, joy means it's internal. Regardless of the situation or circumstance you have found yourself, you will always be joyful. But happiness is a momentary, it's very temporary. Somebody comes now and says, oh, our pastor, Pastor E.K. Kingsley has won $20 million. It's going to be, woo! <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Very true. The excitement is going to pop up. And say, wow. If the same person comes and says, oh, this was a wrong email. It wasn't you. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> You see what I mean? So it's a momentary thing. It's something that is temporary. But when you are joyful, it's eternal. It's, it's forever. It's regardless of the situation or circumstance that you are passing through. So and that is why I say we are going to use somebody because of our time. We are going to use Paul as our case study. Paul, in his last four years, had a very miserable life. He had a very miserable life. For two years, he was in prison in Caesarea. From Caesarea, they took him to Rome. Though Paul has always wanted to go to Rome, but he didn't know that he was going to go to Rome by reason of being imprisoned. And there is this Nero. He's a king. This guy is very good in persecuting Christians. In fact, that is his major work, persecuting Christians. So they moved Paul to Rome. Now Rome, I mean, Paul's situation is so bad. And I'm going to tell us so that at times, you know, we tend to think that, oh, my situation is critical. But probably maybe after this message, we'll be able to understand that your situation is because God wants to glorify himself in your life. The Bible says, Paul, for 24 hours in the last two years in his ministry, for 24 hours, he has a guard. He's always chained to a guard. I'm not saying he's in prison. He is chained to a guard. That means if he wants to wee, if he wants to poo, whatever he's doing, he's doing it before somebody. And what they did is that every four hours, the guards were changed. Every four hours. So 24 hours, he was changed to somebody. That means he had no privacy. He had no privacy. And he continued to suffer. But there's something about this man of God that really touched me. And those are the things we want to look at. What do I need to be joyful as a Christian? One, your perspective makes the difference. Your problems are not as important as the way you see the problem. No wonder somebody said, if we put a dot on a white background, some of us, the way we see that dot, it will even become bigger than a five-story building. The way you see your problem is far more important and even bigger than the problem itself. Look at what Paul said 
in his response. This is a man that is always chained to a guard 24 hours. Every four hours they come to change those guards. This man had no privacy, had no nothing. But look at what he said. In Philippians 1, chapter, two, I mean chapter 1, verse 12, he says, What has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. If you were to be in Paul's shoes, I wish we were going to say that. Paul found a reason to be joyful. He did not say, oh, hey, as it means, he did not come to say, hmm, you see what happened to me? That is God's signs telling me that I don't have to evangelize again. In fact, God is telling me to move over to the choir where I don't have to go and people flogging me. He did not come to say, that is a sign. You see what happened to me? That I did not die is God. God is just telling me that this is not your way. Don't go to Rome again. But rather, he chose to see something good from it. He said, what has happened to me? Brethren, I do not know what situation you are going through. I do not know what challenges you are passing through. I do not know what is confronting you. What is the giant before you today? But Paul had every reason to see something good. Even from what that he was passing through. What that has happened to him. And brethren. The life of Jesus and Lazarus. When things happen to us. How do we react to it? Somebody comes and says. Oh you've lost your job. Do you say. Hey oh, my own is finished. Oh, I am dead. I've lost my job. How will I pay mortgage? How will I do this? Do you know one funny thing? That is, what the devil, that is where the devil actually wants to keep you. He wants you to be in that state of lamentation. He wants you to be weeping, gnashing, crying. He wants you to be in pain. So when you come to say, oh, I've lost my job. How will I pay mortgage? Hell, they will collect their house. Oh, TD, Scotia. The devil will be saying, God, you see what he's saying? He said he's dead. Please, let's kill him. He's using his own mouth. He said it has finished. His mortgage, his house will be taken away. Oh, yeah, TD, Scotia. Oh, the, come and take it away. What you say, the way you see your situation, the way you see the problem, plays a very vital role. They came to Jesus. They said, ah, Jesus, you know what? Your friend that you love, Lazarus, is dead. There are two things I want us to understand with Jesus' attitude. The Bible says, look at what Jesus did. Jesus did not panic. He was calm. When a man is calm, even in the unfavorable situation, there will be a headway. I told us that when a man is confused, he can never find solution. Because a confused mind, a confused state, is running heter skater. When you find yourself in the storm of life, we need to be calm. We need to be calm. Jesus said, oh, really? Okay. He didn't say, oh, my friend Lazarus is dead. Let's go, let's go. No. He was calm. He didn't speak any negative word. Do you know what he told his disciples? He said, see, our friend Lazarus is sleeping. Let's go and see. When you lose your job, what comes out from your mouth? The things you say are the things the enemy will use against you. And I want us to understand that the things we do plays a very vital role. Look at Joseph in Genesis chapter 50 verse 19 to 20. When the brother sold him out. And the brother finally came to where he was. He says, see, this thing that you people did to me. That you thought was evil. That the Lord has used it. So that I can be able to save you people. In days like this. He didn't come to say, ah, you wicked brother. You people sold me. And you, you would die. See, you would die in hunger. This hunger will kill you people. He showed love. He understood that the situation. That was meant for evil. Turned around for good. No wonder the psalmist in 23 verse 4 he says, see, though I walk through the shadow of value of, he said, but what? I shall not be afraid. Brethren, there will be trials, there will be challenges. But how do you handle it? How do you see it? From which point? Is it from the point of God, the eyes of God, you are looking at that situation? Or you are looking at it from the human perspective and you are beginning to shout woe and begin to condemn yourself as if there is no God? I want us to know that there is God and he cares about us. Paul has always wanted to go to Rome. But he never knew that he was going to go to Rome through the prison. And at the end of it all, he was still able to say that what has happened to me is for the advancement of the gospel. When you lose your job, do you tell yourself that yes, I've lost my job, but I know that God has a better plan for me. Is that how we see it? When we came to Canada, right from when we were even in Nigeria, 
my wife, for so many of us, read that do not know. She read microbiology. But from day one, I think apart from one year that she worked in oil and gas, she has always been in the banking industry. And she has been there, grew so high for over 10 years. Brother, when we came to Canada, she wanted to be a nurse. So she started the process, she applied. And all of a sudden, she got a job with Target. Target that is out of Canada now. And uh, she was employed as a team lead. After a while, out of envy, one of the ETLs, one of the people that are leading over there, saw her as a threat because she's very smart, she's good at everything. So she saw her as a threat and was looking for a way to kick her out. As God will have it, her admission in school came true. So that very week, they told her, they said, they wrote her email and said, we need your response. We need you to accept this offer or you defy it. And it has to be that week. I think maybe sometimes Thursday was the deadline. But my wife, because she's a team lead, she's earning money, she's feeling good, she's not really, she doesn't really know what to do. But I called her, we prayed about it. Brethren, I think on a Tuesday or so, they fired my wife from Target. When they fired her, oh, I felt bad. Because I'm like, you are any good money, we are planning on this, your door. What is coming up here? She felt bad as a human being. But we prayed. We said, God, let your will be done. Because she was fired. She didn't have to think about her admission again. She took that admission straight on. She went to school. Brethren, after she finished, she completed school and everything and started work, four months after she finished school, Target was closed. Brethren, if she had continued that job, she would have lost his admission. Maybe by now she will be looking for which school to go at this old age. I do not understand. But brethren, then it was very painful. We felt, oh, why? But we committed it to God. Why am I telling us this? There is always a good thing out of everything that looks evil or bad to us. Brethren, from human perspective, the things we consider evil, the things we consider bad to God is very good. If she wasn't fired that very week, brethren, I mean that same week, that if she had not responded to the email, she would have, that was the same week a day before they fired her. And that helped her to make up her mind. Today she's a very successful nurse. And that is what God is able to do. Brethren, there are things we might not understand. But God, who see it, who know it the beginning from the end, is organizing our life for a victorious ending. Brethren, time will fail me today. But I want us to understand that the second thing we need to take into consideration as well, is setting our priorities right. Setting our priorities right. We should be able to distinguish between trivia from the significant. What does this mean? It's as good as saying you must be able to know what your needs are and what you want. Most of the times we allow issues that does not count, that does not make sense to rob us of our joy. And that is what the devil is doing. Brethren, I hate to say this, but it's very true. 20 years ago, attackers of brethren are, on the, are the unbelievers. When you're going to follow, you say, ah, he's going to church again, you know, yeah, Jesus, you know, father of Jesus and all the rest of it. All. But I want you to understand that the people that are castigating you now are even right in the church. Just because the, the devil is doing all that to rob you of your joy. And that is why so many of us, because we don't have, we don't even have goals, we don't set our priorities right. We tend to listen, we major on the minor, and we lose our focus. Oh, did you see how Sister Christy looked at me? The way she looked at me, I don't even understand. Does she think she's too superior or what? You focus on things that does not matter. And the moment you allow that, the devil sets in. Brethren, back home, God has really helped us as a family. In the church where we are, we started by, you know, because we love anywhere we are, we, we love imparting lives. So what we did was that we started um, reaching out to the needy in our church, myself and my wife. Every month, we will buy stuff, we will come to church, we will split it into nylons, give it out to people. All of a sudden, within two months, somebody said, we heard it, somebody said, mm, they are showing up, they want to show us that they have money. How can they, meanwhile, we were doing it because we felt there are People that I need clothes, food, and everything. We were just doing it on our own. 
So they started saying all this. And I'm like, okay, no problem. We have a goal. Nobody is going to debar us from doing these good works. And as God, we have it. We started having people from church. Church members started joining. Oh, Brasson, we love this. We are going to be doing this with you people. We have over like 20, 30 people join us. Every month, people will bring stuff, bring food, bring clothes. We started giving it out. And honestly speaking, within six months, we started that. The church grew so rapidly. Because people started coming to church. Wow, that church, mm, people started coming. Because we had the goal. We did not listen to what people... Brethren, to be very honest with you, it is not very easy that you hear people saying things that are not right about you. But when you have a goal, when you have set your priorities right, things cannot change you because you know what you're doing. No matter what they say, you don't bother. Also, in that same, in another church, they set us up. They said, oh, Brother Conyo, we want you to be the chairman of the building committee because we needed to build the church and not the rest of it all. And in that church, by his grace, we raised tens of millions. Somebody came and said, oh, Brother Conyo. You know, people can be very funny at times. Somebody take a taxi. They want you to pay because some people have contributed. And I'm like, this is church money. We need to be accountable. Uh, brother Conye, I went to go and find out the cost of this cement. Uh, I paid taxi. And come and imagine the ridiculous amount. People will always tell you. Just like somebody will tell you that he took a drop from this church to make night $400. And they want you to pay. I said no. People started coming up again. They started saying, oh, he's treating the money as if it's his personal money. Uh, what is it? Self? It's people that have contributed. We need to spend it. I said no. This is not right. No matter what they say, I did not back out. By his grace, that building is there. We were able to build it, we were able to raise it. Brethren, people will always talk about you. In fact, either you are good, or you are bad, or you are ugly. People must talk about you. But it's up to you to listen or not to listen to them. And that is why we need to have a goal. We need to set our priorities right. When, like Sister Boston, are coming to say, oh, brother, somebody will say, oh, this sister, your own is even too much. You are always everywhere. Do you have to pay attention? No, because you know what you are doing. You are doing it right because this is the house of your father. And when you understand that fact, that you are doing it for the Lord God Almighty, the things people say will not bother you. Look at what Paul said. Paul too had a situation like that. Paul said in Philippians chapter 1 verse 15 to 17, he said, there are competitors outside criticizing him and attacking his ministry. Brethren, the quickest way People will steal your joy. It's gossip and criticism. Are you going to allow them to take away that vision that God has given unto you? Our third point is leaning on God's strength. Brethren, for us to be joyful at all times, we need God's support. We need to keep depending on God's strength for us to be able to make it true. Uh, and if we look at, just like I said, we are using Paul as our reference point today. Paul, in Philippians chapter 1 from verse 19 to 20, he says, Paul draws his strength from the prayers of the people. Brethren, in times when the storm, when we are faced with storm, there, it is not a sin for you to go to the pastor and say, Pastor, I need you to join me in prayers. There is nothing wrong in you going to... Brethren, we need each other's prayer to be able to be joyful, to be able to stand firm. And most importantly, we need the help of the Holy Ghost. He said, I am not alone in this world. He is my companion. He is my comforter. That is why a walk with the Spirit is very essential. Brethren, time will not permit me for us to look at part of all the benefits. But I want you to know that part of the benefit is prosperity. We already talked about good health. How the Bible says, a merry heart doeth good. I mean, good health, prosperity are all part of the benefits of God. I mean, of uh, being joyful. To conclude this message, I want to say that Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Brethren, we need to pray and pin our hope in God Almighty. If we are able to follow suit these key points, I'm telling us that we'll be able to live a joyful life. Because we'll be able to understand that all the stress, all the pressure is from the enemy just to rob us of our joy. But we are not going to give up because Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith, the I am that I am, the one who created the heaven and the earth, the one who knows the beginning from the end, is there for me to support me. He loves me and he cares for me. He will not allow the storm of life to overtake me. Psalm said in 23, 4, he said, though I walk through I walk through, I will not be consumed because I will not be afraid. God will be there to support me. I want us to be on our feet.
I want us to be on our feet. Let us begin to talk to God. Let us lift up our voice unto God. Let us say, Father, today I have heard your word. Father, I have heard your word. Now I know that the storms of light, a life is only meant to distract me. The storms of life from the enemy is just to pull me away from my focus. To set me away from my goal. Today I have heard your word, Lord. Father, Lord God, I say in the mighty name of Jesus, concerning every unfavorable situation in my life, I will walk through and not be afraid because I know you are there for me. Because I know you are there with me. Brethren, I want us to close our eyes. Our viewers online, if you're listening and you know that the Lord has touched you today, this is the time we've been waiting for. I want us to close our eyes. All eyes closed, all heads bowed.